Imagine this. One morning you wake up to discover that you're not in your bed. You're lying in a bed in a hospital. You don't know how that happened. You try to roll over and your body doesn't move. You reach for the call bell, but your arm won't reach to push the button. Now you're getting scared, so it's time to shout. So you scream in your loudest voice, help, and discover that you have no voice. Just then, somebody walks in the room that you know, and you think, oh, thank God. And you frantically try to let that person know that you're trapped in your body. You're in there. You make eye contact. You blink rapidly. You follow them as they move until they figure out that what you're doing is conscious. This is not science fiction. This happens to people. It's called a brainstem stroke. And it's not uncommon for someone to be in a coma and wake up in that situation. The story is not about that, it's about people. I'm a nurse, and not back in 1987, I married a nerd. <laughs> Dixon is his name, he's an engineer, and he and his brother and a couple of their friends had this crazy idea that they were going to build a computer that you could run with your eyes. I volunteered to help because I had just married him and wanted to be helpful and get out of the hospital and help with this project because of my medical background. It took them a year, and within a year, the first eye gaze system was a reality. It was big and bulky and certainly not portable. It was back in the early days of, of personal computers, so the monitors were big. But a person sitting in front of the screen could do a brief calibration procedure, about 10 to 15 seconds, and the camera mounted under the screen would take 60 pictures per second of their eye and translate that into pressing a key on the screen. It would predict the gaze point with such accuracy that a keyboard could be placed on the screen, and someone who could not speak, move, breathe in some cases, do anything but had one functioning eye, could type a message and speak it with a voice that was synthesized and sounded an awful lot like Stephen Hawking. Jump ahead a few years and I started traveling around the world with this technology because it turned out there was a real need. There were more people than we ever expected who were locked in their bodies. And they somehow found us before there was an internet. We'd get letters and phone calls from various places, and it got me traveling. In 1995, we had our first international customer, a man named Philippe Vigand. That's Philippe in the center of his family with the dog on his lap. And Philippe experienced something very similar to what I first described. He did wake up in a hospital bed, and his wife, Stefan, was there and realized quite quickly that he was locked in his body. He'd been in a coma for months. Jump ahead a few years, well, jump ahead a few months, actually, and Dixon and I ended up flying to Paris, where he lived, and taking an eye gaze computer for him to try. It took him about a day to be able to type a message to his wife, and what he typed in English, in spite of the fact that he was French, was, I love you. Jump ahead some time, and Philippe and Stefan went on to write a book about those experiences. Not many people survived back then with that type of injury. And then, after that, Philippe, who had been a book editor, changed his career and became a book author, and went on to write and publish six books that we know of, and there might be more. The most recent one, I don't even have a copy of yet. Philippe's not the only amazing story, though. There are loads of people trapped in their bodies who are able, with the help of technology, to use their eyes to communicate and to do tons of cool things. This is Joe Martin. 
Joe was a vice president of a big bank in the United States, and the bank was undergoing merger negotiations. He was doing the negotiating, and he developed motor neuron disease called ALS in the United States. And that really changed his life because he was in the midst of this big project. He continued the negotiations through to the end, even though he lost the ability to move his body and the ability to speak. By then, we had email, and he sent emails with his eyes and finished the negotiations. After that, he retired and went on to write a couple of books, and one of them was a novel. We're not limited to adults. This is Cassie. She got her first system when she was eight years old. And back then, we weren't sure that this was going to be good technology for children because uh, pictures didn't exist for computers yet. So Cassie, who had never had the ability to do anything in her life, who was born with cerebral palsy but sat in a classroom, actually learned how to do everything using her eyes starting at age eight. The first thing she did, sitting in front of a keyboard on an eye gaze system, was to type a word. I thought she was stuck. She was just trying the system for the first time. So I reached over to get her off of that screen, and her mom said, oh my gosh. She had typed Brian. Brian was the name of a boy in school she had a crush on. Isn't that incredible that you can be that trapped in your body but even so, learn so much. And that's what she did. She went on to go all through school with, his, with eye gaze systems. She went to high school, she took college courses, and ended up landing a job as a, graph, a designer, graphic designer for T-shirts. And that's a picture of her as an adult. This is a favorite friend of mine. This is Jack. Jack got his first eye gaze system when he was 12. He has a progressive disability that left him having a hard time keeping up in school. He could no longer manage a computer, even though he could still speak. And his school got him an eye gaze system so that he could keep up in class. At 16, Jack ended up with pneumonia and ended up in a respirator in an ICU in a hospital. His eye gaze went with him, and there it is. And he used it to direct his care to the amazement of the doctors and nurses who had never seen this technology at that point. But I know what he was really doing with that system because I'm his friend on Facebook and he was updating his Facebook page every day to keep in contact with his friends, not me, the 16-year-old friends he had. And so age appropriate in spite of the severity of his disability. I wanted to put this one in. This is a little boy named Liam who had his first eye gaze system before he was two. It was an experiment. I didn't think a child that young would be able to understand what they were doing. It's cause and effect. You look at something and make something happen. This little boy was really bright. He navigated around then pictures and animated text, which we have now on systems, and within about five minutes had memorized how to get to a screen with a bunch of animal videos so that he could select them and watch them. There's a whole long list of people doing cool things. There was a newspaper columnist who wrote his column with his eyes. The first time he tried eye gaze, he struggled some. I went and sat in a corner and read a book to give him a chance. And pretty soon, that system said, wow, I have six months of columns in my head. I saw his column, I saw because it was syndicated. He lived in, in New England, I saw it in Alaska, and I saw his column in Colorado. People that read that column had no idea that this man was unable to breathe, unable to move, unable to speak. These are all books that have been written with the eye gaze system. Some of them are in English, many of them are in French. Um, a gentleman in Australia wrote a book, um, someone in Germany, a woman in Germany, wrote a fabulous cookbook with all illustrated. The point being that people are people. They may be trapped in a body that doesn't work, but that doesn't mean they can't contribute to the world. There was a, a man that was a computer programmer who used his eye gaze system to run a computer to program it, 
and he could not breathe, speak, or move, and he worked full-time. He telecommuted at MIT in the United States, and he continued to do that for probably three or four years and supported his family in spite of the fact that he had no physical ability to do anything. I don't remember what the next slide is. Oh, that's what the system looks like today. It's not big and clunky anymore. It's a tablet. The camera is tiny. Still works basically the same way. Now we have nice colors. We have pictures. There's a couple things that I hope you remember from this, and that is that you can't judge a book or a person by its cover. When you see someone in a wheelchair, in a, in, in a wheelchair and find yourself speaking to the person pushing the chair, you're doing yourself and the person sitting in the chair a disservice. It could be that that person is the most interesting human you ever met. They could have incredible things to share with you, and they may well have a way to communicate. The most difficult cases are the ones that we solved with the eye gaze system. So speak to that person, because what they have to say could be really important. I have a quote, and I wrote it down because I don't want to get it wrong. And here it is. Sorry about this. This is a classy piece of paper. A young woman named Mei Lin, who has a progressive disease, wrote on her blog with her eyes, I learned that our human experience is mutual, but society, more often than not, outcasts those who are different. That's very true. The biggest surprise I've had traveling around and meeting all these people is how happy they are. My fear was always that they would be not wanting to live, It's never happened in 30 years. These are folks living their lives. They're sharing with their families and their friends. They're going on vacations. They're going to the movies. They're reading books online. They're texting friends. They're watching movies that they're under control of. So they're living a full life in spite of being that disabled. A woman I met probably 20 years ago really summed it up for me, and I've remembered these words for all those years. The first time she tried eye gaze, she typed and spoke, probably back then in a voice that was pretty mechanical sounding compared to today. She typed, to communicate with the world is to be alive. Without that, better off dead. Thank you. <laughs>